Hey guys, Jennifer Daniels here at home with children running around. Um, some of you know that one of my greatest joys is dishing with other creatives about their process and how they wrestle that muse to the ground. Today I got to Zoom with Estelle Ford Williamson. She's releasing a novel called Rising Fawn, and if that sounds familiar to you, maybe we're neighbors because it's set right here on Lookout Mountain. Estelle is an award-winning writer. She does workshops at places like the Pat Conroy Literacy Center, and uh, that's in Beaufort, South Carolina, where she lives now, the low country, but she's from Chattanooga. Uh, she went to school in South Bend. She's lived in Chicago. She's survived earthquakes in California, but she moved back down south, had this whole career in management and career development, and uh, finally gave in to her creative writer. So she's two novels in, and she uh, she also has this nonprofit called Wells for Hope, and we'll talk about that some. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this. It's sort of my first vlog type thing, bringing these creatives to you. So uh, we'll, we'll dive right in. We're talking about Rising Fawn, the novel. Claire Connor is, um she's the strong woman she helps other people she's a life coach i love the irony of the fact that she's a life coach and then in the first couple chapters her life just starts spiraling out of control yeah it was, it was painful in an entertaining and wonderful way but it was painful to see all the things that keep happening i, I just felt like she was this job character another thing happens another thing happens i don't think it's a spoiler to say in the middle of all that her marriage is sort of in real trouble um, yeah. and, and then, and she, her mama is, has had a stroke. Is that right? And so her yeah. mama is not very communicative. And it sounds like maybe her mama never was too, cause like there were a lot of. Right. She's a mystery. Her mom's a real mystery. The mother ne never was the mother that never was. Right. And, uh, yeah. So it's, there's, there's a lot there leading to the fact that she didn't even know her mother owned this property on the Alabama side of Lookout Mountain. But, you know, she ends up there as uh, some people say, oh, a single wide. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is really different from a chick from Atlanta, you know, this well coiffed woman from Atlanta that teaches people how to live their lives and has this wealthy lifestyle, you know, gosh, how is she going to deal with that? And yeah. So, sort of, she is almost ghosted away from this, uh, this high, busy, powerful life in Atlanta to this yeah. very rural, very, you, you made it sound just like it is, beautiful and lush and, and the mm -hmm. mountains that come together from the seismic activity that is sort of um, mirroring her own seismic activity in her yeah. personal life. Yes, yeah, that, that had a resonance for me and that, that's what a possible breakup, that's what a marriage breakup is like, I think. I think that's what it would be like, uh, where all of a sudden you're not who you were and not just because of the marriage, but because of all the things that go with it, all the trappings, you know, sure. the friends, the, the, the clothing, the job. When that goes away, who are we? You know, it's kind of what I was wanting to get to. We all kind of live on a cliff, you know? <laughs> we live on that, that I mean, Johnson's crook of, you know, right. one, <laughs> one step over. <laughs> right, we do so draw on our personal experiences and mm -hmm. I find, you know, I'm, I'm sort of new to this whole writing things longer than three, four minute songs. So mm -hmm. I, I love to glean from you and from other authors that are already established. Do you find that yeah. you do draw a lot on your real experiences? Writers and, and creative people of any sort or anybody, you, we experience things and we say, you know, that's really significant. And something that was significant to me when I was um, thinking of, uh, you know, was thinking of stories. Um, I had a friend who had grown up in a household, a three-generation um, uh, household in Pittsburgh, and she was Italian. Her father was Italian. The grandmother was Italian. The mother was Irish. And there was a lot of friction in that household. And she, to me, when I first met her, buried her Italian nature because it was such a traumatic experience. So she kind of buried it, but, you know, it would come out in... The, the clothes she wore or the, her gardening and her love of sculpture and art. All these things, it was like, it was just dripping all over, but you know, <laughs> it, but she wasn't acknowledging. And also she was dark haired, you know, olive skin. Just in my own experience, I've met people over a lifetime of um, meeting people and getting to know them quite well, deeply, that there are things in their backgrounds they never tell you, mm -hmm. that they somehow it just comes out and you say, gosh, what they've overcome. 
you know, the things they were dealing with and they, I never knew it. They were just, you know, like a duck on water where everything was very calm, but they were paddling like heck underneath, you know. This is what I love about you so much is that you treat your characters with that kind of compassion. You truly are a compassionate person. I want to oh, talk a little bit about your nonprofit. But first of all, I, I would love to hear you do a, a bit of reading from the Rising Fawn novel, if you don't mind. I'd love to, and I have to tell, you were going to speak. I'm sorry. I was just going to share the screen so they can see the cover here. Okay. So here is the beautiful Rising Fawn cover. And then I'm going to read a, a lovely quote by an author about your book. There's one in particular I love. Oh, from Cassandra King. Um, the routine case of identity fraud takes a young woman on a shocking journey of self-discovery where she's forced to uncover a tangled skein of family secrets that will change the course of her life. I love it. Keeps you up into the night. I felt that way too. It is, it's fast paced. Once you get to Rising Fawn where you think everything's going to slow down, mm -hmm. it sort of all accelerates. Right. right. And the characters are, are so so much a part of that. And I have to tell people that um, I know you, Jennifer, because I I loved your music first. Awesome. I knew I, uh, we my husband and I got to discover you in, in um, Eddie's attic and other rooms around Atlanta and in Rome, I think. And we followed you. And um, I, I'm, one of these days I'll make it when you're at Delonago or you'll come down to where I am. I'm in Beaufort, South Carolina now. I moved there from Atlanta about four years ago. Um, so it, we'll bring you down here so I can get to follow you still. Love Thank you. Thank you so much. And so here's uh, Claire and she's come to this um, jam, uh, uh, Gordon, um, a, a person she meets on the mountaintop. Um, a long haired guy says, you know, you need to come to this jam. It's going to be at my cabin. Um, and so she's there. She's by herself now. She's left her husband. Her husband is the one who told her she needed to leave because he was scared about this financial trouble they were in. Claire decided she needed, uh, back in Gordon's cabin, the couple she'd seen at the van were busy setting up the electronics and Gordon had such an excited look on his face. She realized she was not going to get his attention to make her exit anytime soon. Folks, welcome Jill and Jean Weldon. They're trying out their equipment here for a gig in Nashville. Woohoo, Nashville. Hope you'll welcome them as they give you a sample of what they're going to play for some producers at a small label up there. Stick around, they'll be ready in a minute. Intrigued, Claire took her place back on the floor behind the couple, now drawn closer than ever. She'd have to endure the spectacle of love in front of her for a little while longer. Jill and Jean tested the microphone amid friendly, friendly boos from the acoustically oriented bluegrass fans. Jane turned up, tuned up, a 12 string guitar and Jean plugged in the keyboard, pressing buttons for various instruments and effects. Jill began singing and Claire sensed immediately she was vastly different from the others. While the instruments were borrowed from the mountains, Jill's voice was different. Quicksilver movements up and down, hard to know where it would go next. It was melodious and rich, but also haunting. Her voice lifted up the scale and raced down to depths of warmth and intimacy and ardor. As compelling melodies, and rich, but also haunting, uh, excuse me, it, hard to know where it would go next. It was melodious, rich, but also haunting. Her voice lifted up the scale, then raced down to depths of warmth and intimacy and ardor. As compelling melodies came from her 12 string, Jean played in the background and Jill sang with words that didn't rhyme and that refused to refrain, but ran on and on. Claire thought of Joni Mitchell in the hard to guess way the singer played with notes. She sat transfixed as the woman's eyes closed and her mouth opened in those wild vocalizations, eerie and chilling, filled, uh, filling Claire with electricity she'd never felt from the music. Then applause cascaded from all around, from that gentle audience of believers wrapped in the spell of the music. Unafraid to speak in front of groups and often chatty with strangers, Claire could not speak. Others gathered around Jill, but Claire sat and drew in the spirit of her music. She finally wandered over to where the couple had placed some copies of their CD and read from the cover. Roots of Celtic folk and East Hennessy relatives were acknowledged in the notes. Jill, the writer of most of the songs, had moved from Northern Kentucky to Lookout Mountain and was discovering more relatives nearby. So she'd incorporated all these threads in her lyrics. Even though she hadn't heard Gordon play his solo, Claire quietly left the party. She'd see Gordon at the store tomorrow and tell him how much she enjoyed the music. 
Right now, she felt a need to let the waves of music continue to wash over her. She felt peaceful and looked forward to returning to a cleaner house. Back in the trailer, Claire changed clothes from her makeshift closet, the open duffel bag on the floor. She put on a knit top and pajama pants and rolled into a bed she'd made from layers of sheets and quilts placed on the single bed, now put back together. This must be how construction workers feel after a long day, she told herself, as she fell motionless into a deep sleep. As people can tell, we, this is a thinly disguised version of Jennifer Daniels, and I did this on my own. I didn't do, I, you and I didn't talk about this, and it was after I wrote it, and this book has been in process for many years. I hate to say how many. I would tell you occasionally, I have something about you in a book, and you said, oh, good, good. Let me know when you have it come out. But yeah, thinly disguised, but I, it, Anyway, it was it was important to me to uh, for my character to go there because she was lost up in this mountain environment. She um, she had had a really bad experience at a a, a store, um, gas station, bar, you know, get your red wigglers here kind of place on the side of the road where she felt really intimidated by the people, and she didn't know what she was going to find at the mountain. She ended up there late at night just barely making it in. And, you know, here she's find, find all this disarray, a, a family that's been evicted from the trailer, all their stuff is all around. She's, she's missing Willie, although she doesn't want to be with him, maybe under the circumstances, she's just really in a mess. And, and here are these people that invite her to play, uh, to hear music. And um, that has a, it, it, maybe this is just, too autobiographical novel in some ways, but my sister played music with a group called the Warblers in Athens for about 16 years. And I'm sat in many a farmhouse listening to music with them and it, I loved it, I loved it. So I wanted to paint that scene and, and put you in it. You know? I love I love how Jill has the 12 string and, and mm -hmm. the husband and it's just, I don't know if they're husband, but, but it's just so lovely. Um, and I'm honored that I had some, you know, that you took something from my shows and that made a, that made an impression on you. Well, you've said this, creativity just spreads. If I could give anything to the world, it would be just have this freedom to mm -hmm. let loose, to move, to, to own all of the beautiful stuff inside of you and, and let that come out and react to the world. Well, music is how I change scenes, you know. I'll turn on music or I have music a lot of times um, going when when I'm writing you do. and um, I've had your music playing I've had other Celtic music playing I've had Bob Marley playing you know I just have a lot of music that and the um the basketball ring outside or the way I get you know take my breaks <laughs> I, love, I want footage of you out there tossing the basketball <laughs> I have a friend, Barb Bout, she's a fellow writer in South Carolina, and she is a former basketball coach for Vassar in um, colleges in California. She's working on her writing, and I asked her to help me on my shots. In Tennessee, when I was growing up, girls did not play full court. I was a guard. I would only stay on one half the court, so I never was a shooter. So, yeah, right. And so uh, I never got the pleasure of being a shooter, so uh, she gave me tips i've been hitting them really really good so i love it i love that yeah never okay. take the tennessee out of the girl <laughs> here's my question for you pantser or plotter i i i peg you as a plotter i put i think you've got the outline going you kind of know where their story's going ahead of time am i right i'm a, I'm, I'm a jennifer daniels winging it <laughs> at first i'm winging it and i'm i'm writing about the characters and the situations and I, someone gave me permission a long time ago not to do it in sequence, you know, to give the little in the little glimpses of people. Like um, in Claire's case, when she's upset with her husband, she takes the statue of the kiss um, and moves it away from the mirror so she won't see it. Uh, that's that's when she's upset, you know, and she's she can't stand the thought of that and that scene of intimacy. It's Rodin's the kiss. It's a um, museum model and she moves it somewhere else. Those, just those little glimpses, the show don't tell, the ways of showing are so wonderful. So I have a linear outline, but it's not 
this happens, this happens, this happens. It's how I inter there are places where I interweave the tension or interweave the question that goes throughout these chapters. Um, but uh, that's what I use eventually. And I don't use it absolutely, but I have to have a guide or I will don't know where I'll end up. But it first starts with the character and the situation and writing about that and me journaling that character and me adding more things and asking questions, well, what would happen or what can happen here or what would be really awful that would make her feel really off? Let's there. really plunge her somewhere horrible. Yeah. yeah. So do you ever come to it and read what you've written the day before or whatever and just be like, oh, I'm just throwing the whole thing out? Mm, yeah. <laughs> There, there are those times, and um, there are those times when I should have done that. You know? <laughs> and somebody says, you've got her stomach in every other page. Can you just kind of get rid of that? <laughs> so I will say this, that it's a, it's a lonely process. You have to be, you have to be okay with uh, forgetting Facebook, forgetting um, birthdays sometimes, or whatever, <laughs> to, get it, to get it down and to write. The, what what your your story is about um but the break i was telling you about and because you asked about the nonprofit work uh, a pastoral associate at my church called me into her office and she said i want you to um work with majok marrier to have his book turn into a book his his writing turn into a book and majok was one of the lost boys of sudan this i was in atlanta i lived in atlanta and um he was one of many who came to cities in the United States um, from the refugee camps in Kakama, uh, Kenya, as a result of them having fled the civil war where Sudan was warring on South Sudan in the 1980s. He was seven years old and he had to flee his village because the Sudanese troops were firing on them. And he basically, with the help of his 17 year old great uncle, walked to uh, Ethiopia. It took them about three or four, maybe longer months to just walk, and they kept walking east. That's all they knew was to walk east because that's where Ethiopia was. And they had to avoid towns and settlements because there would be soldiers there or enemy tribes. And um, so 18 years later now, he's been working for the same employer in Atlanta, um, and he's been working. He and I wrote the book called uh, Seed of South Sudan, Memoir of a Lost Boy Refugee uh, for McFarland Press. And that came out in 2014. We immediately went on a four city tour because I thought we could get some money from up north, you know, to form a, a nonprofit. And we did. We needed $400. We got money from um, by doing talks for poets and writers in Oswego, New York. And um, Cleveland, Ohio, and Syracuse, and Washington, D.C., and we we got enough money to form a nonprofit. We were selling our book, and um, we have built water wells in his home country now, uh, in home vil villages around his home. He there are four, he, four he goes back, right? he water wells. He goes back. He, hit, he gets his employer, M. Carey and Daughters of uh, Decatur, old house specialist, give him an opportunity to get his job, to have his job waiting for him as he goes over there about every two years. Isn't that generous? I mean, yeah. they just say, you know, tell us when you're going to be back. And so he'll have, he'll have two or three months over there. And um, he has married, uh, he's done a traditional Dinka marriage. He's married someone from the area and his family is over there. He stays in the United States, but he um, has raised, this money, he goes to schools, he goes all over and makes appearances and has gathered enough money. We've, as a, as a nonprofit group, we have held walks and benefits. When the movie The Good Lie came out, his stories were part of the Good Lie movie with Reese Witherspoon. Um, we had an, an event where we had a premiere. We, we've done everything. We've, we've sold clothes through, um, Finders Keepers Boutique, you know, we, we do everything we can to raise money and people have been very generous. So it costs about 11 or $12,000 each time a well is built because we've got to pay for his travel, which is significant. We pay him a small stipend for being there. And then the pub, the 
it's the same price as you would get one done in Tennessee or, or South Carolina. They're about $9,000 a piece. So um, we've done that four times and it has had an impact. There's a lot of unsettlement in South Sudan because of um, warring between the different tribes of 65 tribes. His area is fairly cohesive. They're mostly Dinka, so they haven't had that. But um, also they have food. They can grow more food now. They don't have to worry about not having food, they don't have to go to refugee camps, which a lot of people have when they have, um, you know, droughts and not enough food. They have water from the from the wells, so they can grow their own. Food. Walk several miles every day. Yeah. Oh yeah, like four to five miles a day, uh, one way. Then they have to wait in line because everybody else is there getting water, and then they walk back. Well, that doesn't happen now that we have the, the wells and the villages. They can pump their own water. And they're hand pumps. They're not solar. They're not anything fancy. But they are so happy. They are so happy to have that. And the women now can make money selling um, vegetables in the market because they, they have enough water to grow excess in addition to just their own needs. And that's a powerful thing because women and there's no ca it's not a cash economy at all it's a cow economy so they can purchase um health services for their health they can get health care if they can walk 12 miles um or if someone can carry them 12 miles you know there are um health services in um room back the nearest city, town um but they now can um they at least can pay for the medicines yeah, you know, which is usually a big expense whenever they have problems. Um, malaria, huge, 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 huge problem. And they get it all the time, repeatedly. So it's, it, it, they have worse problems, they have worse um, health problems that have to be addressed as well. But just, you know, trying to keep ahead of the malaria is a major thing there. And childbirth is very, very risky. Like one in seven children don't make it past two years. One in seven women die in childbirth. So very, very sad circumstances. We hope we can get more medical care for them, but at least we have a motorcycle. They have a motorcycle we bought them so they can drive. Some of them can drive. They can, you know, hold on, you know, and, and get driven to. Is there a particular um, site or how do people find out how they can help or just even find out more about it? It's Wells for Hope, like Wells for hope.org. Cool. Um, any last thoughts? Follow your bliss. Find people who support you and, and keep going. Keep Amen. Going. Yeah. All right. I'm inspired. I'm going to go right, right now. Wow. I, I am too. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. This has been so generous of you to, to make this. Oh, it is really my appreciate. pleasure. I sure appreciate your time. And y'all, this is Estelle Ford Williamson. I will make sure to have links for her uh, different sites that she's mentioned and how to find her book Rising Fawn, which is on pre-order now and officially comes out January 5th. So thank you so, thank much. You so much. Thank you.